and gentlemen, gentlemen. Welcome to the Block Crunch Podcast, the go-to podcast for investors and builders in crypto. Before we get started with today's episode, I've got some great news for our listeners. For those of you looking for an extra edge in crypto, we created Block Crunch VIP just for you. Every week, our team at BlockCrunch prepares an in-depth research memo with a sector analysis, project explanation, competitor breakdown, and our own in-house investment outlook for every project brought onto the show, delivered straight to your inbox. We'll do the work so you don't have to. We'll scour Discord, Twitter, forums, and blocks, and help you highlight potential catalysts and provide actionable insights for every project we interview. In addition, we'll also host exclusive AMAs with myself to answer any of your questions. And all of that is only available to BlockCrunch VIP subscribers. But the good news is that it costs less than a coffee a week. So head on over to theblockcrunch.com slash VIP or click the link in the show notes below to sign up. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the BlockCrunch podcast. Now, this week, I'm very honored to interview Kevin Zhou, the hedge fund manager who has made headlines recently by being one of the very, very few people in the world to vocally call out the impending collapse of Terra Luna during its peak at $40 billion. And that was not at all a popular stance to take, let alone publicly, but Kevin stuck to his guns. And just this past week, the short thesis finally played out as Luna's entire market cap effectively evaporated over the course of a few days. So we're not going to do a play-by-play about exactly what happened with Terra Luna. Uh, we're going to save that in written form for our VIP subscribers. But instead, we're going to dive into you know Kevin's process, how he identified some of the unsustainable economics in the project and lessons we can learn from that, as well as how we can move forward as a space. So uh, first of all, super excited to have you on the show for the first time, Kevin. Uh, yeah, super excited to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been a really momentous uh, past week. Um, you know, I think uh, for me, I'm running on a little bit of uh, low sleep right now. So you apologize to the viewers if I'm a little bit groggy. Uh, but yeah, happy to chat about what happened. And uh, yeah, I'm yeah, ready definitely. To get started, whatever. And su- super appreciative of you. I know it's early morning your time as well. And it's probably a pretty crazy past seven, eight days. Um, so I guess like first, just how do you feel about things? Like, do you feel almost vindicated that the things you warned about finally came true? Or do you feel kind of shocked that they played out in such a massive magnitude? Um, yeah, you know, definitely a bit vindicated. You know, I was pretty vocal about this stuff along with a few others on, on crypto Twitter. Um, and, you know, for the most part, initially, we were met with a lot of severe backlash. You know, the lunatics, they were uh, in all of our threads and, and tweet threads and just slamming us and calling us uh, all manner of names. Uh, so, I, you know, I do feel a bit of vindication there. Um, now, you know, since then, I think, uh, you know, in terms of how it exactly played out, you um, you know, I think it's a little, it's always a little bit hard to call the timing. I mean, this could have happened um, a little bit later. I mean, it could have taken months for this to play out, um, you know, rather than uh, immediately where, where it did um, very recently. So, you know, I think that's always hard to call. But I think in terms of how it played out, uh, once it once it started, I think it really uh, was in line with a lot of what we were predicting. And in many ways, it actually collapsed faster. You know, I thought this whole thing was, um, you know, there is always that kind of bank run risk, but there's also like just bank kind of walk risk, right? Even if it happened in slow mo, um, I also thought that that was a pretty, uh, you know, possible, um, you know, kind of situation. So, you know, it definitely happened quicker and more suddenly than expected, but otherwise, uh, you know, in line with our expectations. Yeah, and internally, we've been talking about some of our skepticism about kind of under collateralized or algorithmic stable coins for a while as well. But uh, we just didn't have that conviction to really put a directional bet on it. So I guess for, for, for those who may not be aware of how you formulated your thesis, what was it about the mechanism in Luna's design that made you kind of realize that, hey, this might collapse one day? Like, what, was there a specific part of the design that made you think that way or? Um, yeah, you know, I think a lot of it is just that, you know, we've seen a lot of these different algo stable coins before in the past, you know, ever since, um, you know, there was like the basis uh, design. Uh, and then, uh, you know, there was like a whole bunch of others. There was like yams, um, you know, basis cash based, um, you know, ample forth, um, ESD, DSD, uh, time, ohm, you know, all of these different 
uh, variations of basically a very similar concept. Now, you know, on the surface, you might look at the mechanisms and you might say uh, they're all kind of different from each other. But I think when you really uh, dig deep, I mean, at the end of the day, these feedback cycles all try to govern this idea that when you have a stable coin, which is above peg, you want to inflate supply. And when you have a stable coin, which is below peg, you want to contract supply. Like it doesn't matter how many steps you go through, uh, through this giant contraption, this Rube Goldberg machine to get to that final result. But ultimately there is that kind of final uh, piece of it that causes the quote unquote stability of the coin. So in my opinion, after having seen a lot of these, I think pretty much they're all kind of equivalent. Um, so that's that's kind of where we got this idea that you know this this um, Luna UST mechanism is basically the exact same thing as all these other coins uh, in the past that have not done uh, super well uh, in terms of you know uh, having solvency and maintaining stability. Now I think I want to uh, maybe point out one particular uh, coin which. Uh, we analyzed very carefully, and we actually did uh, make a very, uh, you know, fairly profitable play um, on which was very instructive in, uh, you know, teaching us about how to even trade these kinds of things. Uh, and that was um, Fay and Tribe, you know. And then when mm. when Fay first came out, um, you know, there was it was like a um, you know, it's just like this coin which you know tons of people invested into it was supposed to be stable. Um, it, in, in effect, it wasn't actually a stable coin. It was kind of like a, um, it was sort of like a structured product on ETH, right? Because you had like all of this like ETH collateral, which was backing this uh, stable coin. And if ETH went up a lot, uh, the stable coin doesn't benefit to the upside, right? It's just kind of capped at one. All the excess value is just like excess value. But if ETH goes down and the the backing to this coin is insufficient, um, then the coin would depeg on, on the downside. So, you know, what what is this like? Well, it's kind of like a put option on ETH, right? You get downside, but you don't get the upside. Um, you know, maybe there's some kind of like hidden premium in the middle, but effectively you can kind of map the payout to basically a put like kind of payout. Um, so when we were trading this thing, uh, and this was during a time where, you know, they're, they're severely gating the exit, right? As it trades below peg, you get penalized more and more. Uh, so it's very, very hard to, uh, you know, fully deviate from the peg, even though everybody wanted out of this thing. And there was like tons of capital stuck in this. All the investors were trying to get out and, you know, it was very severely gated. So it couldn't. Um, so, you know, in, in trading this, basically we were uh, some of the only buyers of uh, this coin of Fay uh, below peg, you know, 85 cents to the dollar and below. And the reason that we were able to buy it is because we we didn't, uh, we realized that we could always just delta hedge um, an ETH put on the other side, right? So like in doing so, even if Fay ended up trading at zero, we make um, everything back on the ETH leg of it, and it would be fine to even hold this coin to zero, and which is why we were, were very comfortable buying it um, when, when it started depegging. So that kind of was was instructive on you know how to trade some of these kinds of structured products. Like at the end of the day, all of these things are basically you know with some obfuscation, structured products on on, on something or other, right? On some kind of underlying. Uh, or other. So I think, um, you know, all of that was very in instructive. And then also examining sort of like the mechanisms of previous um, algo stable coins. That's really, really interesting because um, when Luna first went, when the UST stable coin first depegged, I did cite Fei as a potential example of how maybe they could fix this. They could, there is potentially a way out of this, but obviously it happened for Fei, but not for Luna. Um, so I guess going off of that vein, it, do you think Luna's failure is a condemnation of all algo stable coins or are there models that could work? Because even for Fay, Fay right now is technically a collateralized stable coin already. They're no longer, you know, fully algorithmic. You know, in other mm -hmm. words, are there designs that maybe could actually work? Um, yeah, well, maybe I just, uh, I'll just say one last thing about Fay, which is like, the, you know, the primary difference between Fay and Luna, in my opinion, when you abstract away all like the, the, the small little bells and whistles and contraptions, um, is the idea that like with Fay, it's ether that was backing, um, the stable coin while with UST, it was mostly Luna itself that was backing, um, its stability. So in, in many ways, like Luna and UST are just much more circular with the collateral being endogenous, while Fay was more, um, you know, kind of direct and having external uh, and exogenous collateral. But basically, the idea is the same, which is that you have some kind of volatile asset which is backing some kind of 
stable asset, right? So, so that I think concept still holds, but in terms of like, um, how much reflexivity each one has, well, you're going to have a lot more reflexivity when you have something circularly kind of backing uh, itself. Right. Um, so, so that's, um, that's sort of my first thought. And then, um, the uh, maybe maybe uh, to return to your question, uh, it, it, could you could you remind me again of what that was again? Yeah. So I guess does Luna's failure imply that there's no mm-hmm. algorithmic stablecoin design out there that could possibly work? Um, I'm pretty pessimistic about pure algo stablecoins. I think you know let's leave the class of over collateralized um, algo stablecoins alone. But I think for the pure kind of like skyhook type. Um, you know, I, algo stable coins. Uh, I, I'm very pessimistic because I think at the end of the day, you're really trying to alchemize something from nothing, and you're basically like functioning like the central bank, right? Like maybe you have some control over something that's similar to interest rates that you know help contract or expand the money supply. Maybe you have some control over something that looks like open market operations that has some control of supply and demand. So. Um, you know, that's, that's sort of my thought. I think, I think there's, um, just, uh, some kind of analogy to a central bank function, but without the advantages that most central banks have. Right. So in the sense that, you know, if you look at the fed, for example, the fed has the advantage of, you know, the base currency of the U S is what people must pay their taxes in. Um, and you know, for, for dollars, uh, you know, there's a deal with OPEC that they have to trade oil and, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in us dollars. So I feel like with these algo stable coins, you're basically replicating that, but you don't have those, uh, advantages. Uh, and then, you know, on top of that, I would say that even fiat money itself under standard central banking, uh, systems and regimes, um, in the long run doesn't seem to work either. Right. Um, so that's sort of what my thought is. And that's kind of my analogy for pure algo stable coins. Um, Ultimately, I think they all boil down to the same idea. I would say that all of these mechanisms uh, are basically isomorphic to each other when you really kind of dig deep into like what's going on with supply and contraction. And on that point about using a volatile asset to offset the volatility of the stable coin, in, in this case, using Luna to absorb the volatility, I think a lot of people also had issues with that design. But then when they announced, when Luna announced that they were going to use Bitcoin as uh, part of the collateral as well, I think some people's uh, minds uh, kind of you know began to soften up to the idea of, hey, UST might actually be pretty stable. But obviously, that didn't work out. So what exactly went wrong there? Because they did introduce a significant amount of BTC as collateral, which is supposed to be more stable, but that didn't really play out. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the idea was good. Adding more exogenous collateral uh, was a good idea. It's just in my opinion that it wasn't enough. You know, in the end, they ended up with about 3 billion uh, worth of, of Bitcoin. I think if they got it up to around 10 or 11 billion, I think it would have been okay. It's just, it wasn't, it just wasn't enough, you know, and I think they were, they were just really running out of time. Their goal was to get to about, you know, 10 billion. Uh, but you know, there's just, there's just not enough time to actually get that done. And the collapse happened before that. Um, you know, the other thing too, is that like, where did they get this money from anyway? Right? Like a lot of it is basically coming from selling Luna itself to willing investors on some kind of lockup schedule uh, in return for, you know, hard assets, which they can then use to buy Bitcoin or other types of exogenous collateral. Right. So like at some point, there's always kind of this fear, even within like the investors that they're courting, that maybe this thing doesn't work and maybe they don't actually want this thing, uh, you know, that's locked for like, you know, a year with one year um, linear vesting at some kind of discount, because maybe this thing will just that spiral, right? Like maybe even if they were to hedge it, we're using the perps, maybe the cost of doing that would just be too high uh, in the later stages, right? So even if they think that there's a reasonable chance or a small chance of hyperinflation happening, uh, the funding during that period could be so astronomical that it's totally not worth whatever discount that they're getting, right? So as if they pull expectations forward, um, there's going to be at least some investors that are not willing to take that deal. And what my guess is, is that they were just not able to sell, um, you know, enough, right? Another seven to 8 billion uh, worth of Luna uh, to get this exogenous backing. Um, and I would also say that, you know, this, um, this kind of, uh, this kind of exogenous collateral, the choice of it um, was also really important, right? Like, why was it Bitcoin rather than just like USDC, right? 
Or why was it Bitcoin instead of like an inverse position in Bitcoin, right? So like, or like an inverse position in US equities, for example, right? Like an inverse index. Um, because if you think about it, uh, you, if you have Bitcoin, then you have these kinds of like nasty compression effects um, where it's sort of like as, you know, uh, Luna is going down, so the endogenous collateral is evaporating. Um, there's also all these correlated effects with the ex external collateral, this exogenous collateral, Bitcoin, uh, in that you know it's highly correlated. The beta is highly correlated uh, uh, to Luna itself, right? Under normal market uh, situations, so you're getting contraction of both types of collateral at the same time, rather than something that's anti-cyclical, where you know like a short Bitcoin position as Luna is tanking, Bitcoin's you know the short position is going up. So then, you know, you maintain a lot more uh, stability that way. Now, I think they wouldn't do something like that because it kind of violates narrative. Um, you know, even though it's more sound, they, you know, how do you even maintain, let's say, a decentralized short like Bitcoin position you, or even short Luna position? I mean, you, you can't really. Right. So, you know, it violates like this concept of like decentralization. Now, how much of the decentralization was just like, you know, dog and pony show? I mean, how much really was there in the first place? I mean, that I don't know, but it certainly violates narrative to to start moving in that direction. I think that's maybe why um, they didn't they didn't do it. Like I know that um, you know Harrison Xerox Hams, uh, you know he suggested to them uh, to do some kind of like inverse Bitcoin position. Um, so you know they 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 didn't. I mean this is an idea that they they already had from way back when. I mean he's in their war room. He's already told them about this stuff uh, you know a while ago, and I think they just never listened. Um, so, you know, so that's, that's sort of my thought. I think the choice of the collateral was wrong. And then the second, I think, um, it just, uh, the, it just wasn't enough, you know, 3 billion versus 10 or 11 billion. I mean, there was just a, a really big shortfall there. That makes a lot of sense. And wh when it comes to the tactical element of the actual short itself, was the play to short UST or short Luna? Was there like a preference between the two or were both kind of on the table? Yeah, I think that's um, I think that's a great question because it really depends on um, the gating mechanism that they have, right? So initially, what they had is that you could mint or redeem uh, Luna to UST or uh, UST to Luna at what was it like two hundred million dollars worth per day, um, something like that, right? So if um, the uh, the demand for Luna because UST is unwinding exceeds that per day. Um, then you're going to see like a DPEG event, right? Um, because then people are just going to dump it on the open market rather than go through this very, uh, this nicer path of, you know, just doing the arbitrage, going through Luna, getting dollars worth, close to a dollar's worth of Luna for all UST um, that is burned. Um, so it really depends on the capacity of that avenue on whether or not you think that it's, you know, Luna itself is going to go down more or UST itself is going to depeg. On the opposite side, let's say there was no gating mechanism. Well, then it's just much more likely that UST holds its peg for a lot longer, but it's Luna that itself uh, starts spiraling out of control much earlier. Right. So I think, you know, TFL had a very important decision to make all along the way, because I think near the end, they were allowing the minting of like what, maybe 1 million Luna uh, units per minute or something like that. And then afterwards, I think they just even removed that cap entirely. And then just like, you know, at that point, supply was like doubling every 18 minutes or something like that. Right. For Luna. So, you know, I think they had a very important decision to make, which was whether to favor at least temporarily the UST holders or to favor the Luna holders. Right. And, you know, different times along the way, there were different folks that were favored. I would say generally they tended to favor the UST holders, uh, given that they kept relaxing these constraints uh, to try and hold the peg uh, together as best as they could. I mean, the, the peg was already gone by that time. But I mean, certainly it could have broke down even further uh, if there were gating mechanisms in place to prevent that kind of uh, uh, redemption of UST to Luna. So. Um, so I think, I think, you know, there's definitely some considerations there. And then the other consideration too, is that it, it, there's some, so there's something to be said about the risk that you want to take, right? If you short UST, you're basically making a one-way bet because it's not like UST is just going to pop and rip up to like $2, right? Like it's kind of capped there. If you're shorting at it from like, you know, pretty much the top, um, you know, you can only, you can basically only win. And then, you know, if you lose, you break even. So, um, in that way, a lot safer. But maybe you have to wait some time 
uh, you know, for uh, the, the the peg to really fully break down, right? So it's maybe a little bit of a slower process. Uh, and then the last consideration is um, how do you actually go about shorting it and what are the costs? Um, generally throughout this entire thing, the cost of uh, shorting UST uh, wasn't that expensive, right? What you pay on the perp funding wasn't really that bad. Um, but when you shorted Luna, uh, it got to a point where the perp funding was so bad, it was like, what is it, like five digits, four digits, or five digits, or maybe even beyond that at some point, uh, right? Because it's basically compensating people for the opportunity cost of getting their you know money hyperinflated away you know with the price having every 18 minutes and supply doubling every 18 minutes so that's all reflected on 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 the perp uh, funding rate. So, you know, those are some of the considerations, right? It's like, what are the costs of doing the short? Um, is it a one way bet or is it bi directional, right? Because with Luna, if you short Luna, it can rip in your face. Um, and then, uh, you know, what, what the gating mechanism is. I would say that those are probably the three most important considerations there. Hey guys, I'm really excited to tell you more about one of my favorite products in crypto right now, DYDX. This is a team I've known since 2018, and they've built one of the best exchange venues out there that also happens to be decentralized and mobile friendly. Now listen until the end because there's an opportunity for savvy traders out there as well. And here are just a few reasons why I like DYDX over other exchanges. First, it's very liquid. It processes two to three billion dollars every day in volume and has 35 perpetual swaps as of this recording, which means you can trade things like Ethereum, Bitcoin, Doge, Solana, and most of the most popular assets with up to 20x leverage in the venue today. Now, second, it's also extremely cheap. And if you're down bad from the bear market, you don't have to worry about gas fees at all because there is no gas fee on Starkware Layer 2 where DYDX is built on. Now, that brings me to my next point as well. It's incredibly fast. Unlike other Layer 2 and high-speed DEXs, you don't actually have to wait to withdraw your assets anymore. And as an additional point, by using Starkware, DYDX also provides users with increased security and privacy. And my personal favorite feature is the cross-margin feature, which means I can seed one account with USDC and trade across multiple markets from there without needing to start sub-accounts because I really hate managing so many different sub-accounts. And their iOS mobile app is also live right now, and it's amazing because it's compatible with MetaMask, Coinbase Wallet, Coin98, Huobi Wallet, and a lot of the most popular mobile wallets out there. And it's available for people outside of the US or sanctioned countries today. And one last thing, one exciting opportunity is their competitions. The most recent tier in the $10,000 equity tier have won over $95,000 in rewards. And you can get started with as low as $500 in equity to compete for prizes. So if you're already trading, might as well get paid to do it. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, I highly recommend that you head on over to dydx.exchange to learn more. And I thank them for sponsoring this episode. That makes sense. And it's almost a perfect storm in that, uh, maybe perfect storm is an insensitive way to put it, but the, the, the speed with which it played out, I guess, benefited the shorts because you're not playing, you're not paying funding for a very long time, right? That your, your thesis basically pays out within a week. Um, and I guess on that note, um, you actually, you publicly called the Luna project out, I think earlier this year already, but you also publicly said on multiple occasions that you didn't really pull the trigger on the short until much later. So I guess that that's, probably part of the challenge of shorting in crypto is that speculative frenzy can last for a very long time and can be unpredictable. So I'm curious about your process. Like what were maybe a list of things that you were looking out for to make you decide to pull the trigger on executing the actual trade? Uh, yeah, definitely. So, you know, I think when it comes to shorting, I think it's particularly difficult because uh, being early is sometimes as good as being wrong, right? Uh, so the timing component is um, really important. And then on top of that, there's other considerations, which is that because you're short, uh, even if you're 1x short, you can still get blown up uh, on margin, right? So if the path to get to you being right is very unfavorable to you, you could still get wiped out uh, on your on your liquidity and on your margin. So um, so those are all considerations. And then on top of that, there's borrow costs on the short side, right? Whether it be manifested as perp funding or you actually take physical borrows to go short this stuff, um, you know, overall, it's just more difficult. So for all those reasons, I would say that shorting is more difficult. And then lastly, on the upside uh, for shorting, the upside to shorting is very capped too, right? If you buy an asset, it can go up 100x. If you short something, the best you can do is double your money, right? Uh, unlevered at least, right? Unlevered at least. So um, so I think um, 
with all these considerations, I think getting the timing right was very important. So um, the way that we thought it through wasn't through any kind of like super complicated quant model or anything like that. A lot of it was just kind of, you know, intuition and kind of finger in the air, um, guesswork and back of the napkin kind of math. And basically what we figured is that, you know, this thing is probably going to implode for sure, right? But we just don't know when. And we want to basically, uh, you know, be able to farm anchor until the very last moment to get all the free money and the juice there. Uh, and then finally, when it's time to short, get out before everybody else. So like, is that prudent? Is that safe? Well, I, you know, I figured that just even reading through Twitter and, you know, talking to these lunatics that are interacting with me on my threads, that there is enough true believers in this project that at, at, in the moment of distress, we will be being the cynical people that we are. We're going to be able to get out of this um, a lot quicker than people who are kind of in denial, still have hope, um, you know, high on hopium, uh, these, you know, the true believers uh, and probably a lot of their own, you know, backers and, and them themselves. Uh, so, you know, I, I didn't see that as particularly worrying. We were basically monitoring very closely all the exit liquidity uh, that was immediately available on Curve, for example, um, you know, in the order books. And, you know, when UST started to depeg, you know, just a little bit and liquidity dried up a little bit, we started to see the imbalance in those curve pools. Then we were like, uh, you know, maybe it's happening or but it's maybe fine, too. Uh, we don't know for sure at this point. It's not clear if it's really happening now. But why don't we just be safe? Why don't we just pull it all out uh, and then see where things go? So we started pulling out. And I, I figure that other people that were similar to us, which are more like kind of on the fence about whether this is happening now, generally generally who are a bit pessimistic about this whole system, they also pulled, right? Uh, and that generally started to cause maybe like a cascade. Um, I, I know there were people before us, but I know there were also people after us. And this started to cascade um, out the liquidity and the liquidity basically dried up on all uh, on the curve pools and, and overall in the markets. Uh, and then finally, when it was really dry and it's, we started to see some serious uh, peg deviations, then we thought about, okay, so now that we're out of this thing, maybe it is a good time to start putting on uh, you know some kind of short plays, uh, which which we did, but I don't want to get too much into the details yet because some of it is uh, still ongoing. Uh, but we did end up putting on some shorts uh, around that time, and I think this was Monday. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I distinctly remember there was a small depeg to maybe ninety eight cents, uh, and then it's briefly returned almost to peg, and then there was an eighty five million dollar trade from UST to USDC or USDT on the curve pool almost immediately afterwards. And then things just spiraled out of there. So it does seem like uh, maybe there were large parties that were kind of thinking like you guys, or maybe it was you guys, I don't know, um, that kind of saw the initial DPEC and then just exited. Um, so I guess at, did any point, did, did you kind of doubt that thesis at any point? Because uh, I guess before the DPEC, obviously, um, you know, USD, UST and Luna commanded a really high valuation. And there's a lot of really smart people in the space backing the projects as well. Did you at any point kind of doubt that, hey, maybe our thesis is wrong. Maybe this is a sustainable way of building a stable coin? Um, I didn't have much doubts about the thesis being wrong. I did have some doubts about the timing of it. You know, just after the first DPEG, after the peg closed back up, I thought, okay, maybe this was just a false alarm. Maybe this thing is not unwinding now. Right. So we did have some doubts about that in the intermediate about like the tactical plays uh, that we made uh, in this particular event. But I think in the long term, um, I didn't really have much doubt about that. You know, I think if it didn't collapse that this week, this past week, you know, it would have collapsed like a month later or two months later, maybe even six, you know, three quarters later, maybe even nine months later, you know, um, you know, even possibly even longer. So. Um, so I think on, on that timing, we weren't very sure, but we did think that for sure at some point this thing would unwind uh, because it's just, it's kind of like gravity, right? It's just that we're just like doing back in the napkin math. And even if our assumptions were wrong by, by you know, like two or three X or even greater than that, um, this thing was so insolvent. It was, it was insolvent by, you know. Uh, you know, this was, I think, like seven, eight billion. I mean, that was a healthy margin. I mean, th these are these are yards at stake, right? And then, and you know, in terms of their backers, one of the particular reasons I actually really liked shorting this um, is because uh, you know there was a consensus trade on, which literally it's a who's who of crypto uh, investors, and they're all backing this thing, right? So this is, I think, exactly where you know being a contrarian can be really profitable. It's where everybody believes something 
uh, to be true and they're wrong. And and I think most of the time, uh, that's not the case. I think most of the time when there's consensus, people are right. So I think to find something where uh, that is the case, uh, I think is is particularly nice. And that that's also kind of reflected in our um, style of trading. Um, you know, historically, uh, we've only made a few relatively big plays. Um, I would say about once a year or a little bit like once every year and a quarter. Um, you know, in 2018, uh, we were flat for the entire year. And then we went long uh, Bitcoin in December at a blended price of 3750. And that was the anti consensus trade, right? It was everything was super bleak. Everybody thought that, you know, it was just like terrible. There was despair, there was apathy in the market, there were, there's no reason for Bitcoin to go up. And basically, the idea is, is that everybody is so maximally pessimistic, there are no new pessimists to sell the part of the price further down. Everybody currently holding Bitcoin will literally never sell it at any price, right? And then whoever sold has already sold, right? So it's just like, it's hard to see this thing going down even further. It's so bleak already. It's it's hard to get worse than this, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the the trade that we made in 2019 um, was, um, you know, buying uh, FTT. Um, and that was also not a consensus trade. You know, people forget, but there was a lot of hair on that deal, on that 10 cent round uh, mm -hmm. in the very beginning. Yeah. And a lot of people passed on it. So there was a lot of things. It was a, it was a sort of like the stars aligned because there was a lot of data points that were um, particularly good about that deal. First is that you didn't have all the big name VCs in it because Sam at the time and Alameda, they were still kind of like outsiders, right? Uh, coming into the space. They were not very well known. Um, we had done a lot of um, OTC trading with them already. And, you know, having um, some background uh, in uh, you know, understanding where they come from, like, you know, having a lot of like Jane Street folks, having folks from like Math Camp and stuff like that, having met Sam in person, knowing the guy was very smart. Um, you know, I, I knew that the space was kind of undervaluing this guy. Uh, and on top of that, there was hair on the deal. Uh, like I think Sue called out, uh, you know, earlier, which is that they were offering, you know, 21, 22% quote unquote guaranteed loans, which tarnished their, their reputation and their name. They really shouldn't have done that. That was bad marketing. But, you know, in some ways that kind of helped um, isolate the deal from other pools of capital uh, that might be coming into it. Um, and, uh, you know, I think lastly, uh, I think, you know, there was always um, the, the timing effect where they they rushed the the deal so quickly for FTX um, that there wasn't enough time for people to really get on board and do the due diligence. So that also kind of constrains the amount of capital flowing into this stuff. So all of those uh, put together makes this look like a highly undesirable deal, but that's what exactly what made it much more desirable. And then maybe I don't mean to just continue you know, to toot our own horn, but maybe just as a final example, um, there was the Wi-Fi trade that we did uh, in uh, 2020. Um, and basically that also was not a consensus trade until maybe three days into it. But the whole thing was farmed out, if I remember, in a week, right? So we were uh, the first big whale uh, that was farming Wi-Fi. And the only reason that we were able to do that is because um, when everybody was farming Compound in June and July, right, uh, and we were too, right, um, we actually started studying Curve because we're thinking about well, like what other pools exist, what other things uh, are, are farmable. And we started studying Curve very heavily. And this is before Curve was very popular. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, there was a very unique pool which had all these like Y assets. And we're like, what the hell are these Y assets? So we started studying this. And, you know, we go into a website where the documentation is really sparse. Everything looks very shoddy. The, there was a certificate <laughs> error on the, on the website. I mean, everything looked terrible. Like I thought this thing could have been a scam, right? But after studying it very carefully, what we could, we realized, oh, that's not a bad idea at all. You know, it's like an interest bearing version of these underlying coins, but that they bounce around between these different uh, pools to maximize the yield, like a robo advisor. Like this is never been done before this is actually a pretty cool idea so then we're like okay by the time you know the wi-fi uh, token got announced then we were already familiar with that protocol right so it's like a lot of it was just the preparation of being in the right place at the right time because we had studied curve and wi-fi uh and the the y the, the wire and protocol before um you know before these uh these tokens were launched the wi-fi token was launched right so you know that's sort of the idea right because like right afterwards like two or three days into it then like all these big whales started coming in and farming this stuff right but in the beginning like we just got like a well, like a one to two day head start and that accounted for like more than 
any anybody else uh, got basically because it was just so it was just so juicy and so isolated so that's kind of what we look for we particularly really like these kind of contrarian plays where you have tons of big money and very smart people on the other side um and every once in a while uh, very rarely but every once in a while they're just completely um off base and uh, it makes it particularly uh, uh juicy there yeah, thank you for that very clear breakdown of the process. And, and that's a philosophy that I abide by as well, is you kind of do the preparation because by the time that the play comes, um, it, it's too late to start doing your DD. And in crypto, you know, one or two days difference can can really be all all that matters. And of those plays you mentioned, I think the only one I got right was uh, Wi-Fi because uh, I, I was pu- very publicly about missing out on FTT precisely because of those three reasons you mentioned, which uh, is w- one of the uh, biggest regrets in my career so far, but a lesson learned there. And I guess going back to Luna, would you characterize the way that this played out as a Black Swan event? Because it did require a lot of things aligning. You, uh, Luna was transitioning to the four pool at that time, and you know there were some massive sellers. Um, did, did it require this like specific mixture of events to be happening at the same time, or would have would have happened under any other circumstances eventually anyway? Yeah, you know, I, it was funny because I was in the chat with uh, eGirl Capital, right? And they were <laughs> like, uh, yeah, what kind of Sigma event uh, you guys think this is? And everybody's giving their opinion. And I almost facetiously said, oh, this is a zero Sigma event. <laughs> like it was bound to happen. Um, I think I think over a long enough time horizon, this is basically a zero sigma event. I think it was mm-hmm. fated to be this way. But I think um, in the short term, tactically, I would say probably like something like a two sigma event. You know, I don't think too outlandish, but I think fairly rare, right? There was um, at least tactically in the short term, a lot of things that had to uh, happen at the same time, right? Like this three pool to four pool migration. And you know, what's funny is that um, that definitely exacerbated the problem, but it is possible that even without the three pool, four pool migration, that this thing would have collapsed, you know, maybe would have taken a half a day longer or a couple hours longer, but it could have still just collapsed. I mean, that, there wasn't that much liquidity in three pool, uh, you know, that, that TFL pulled when they were migrating over to four pool. And I, what I would say is that what, what would be really ironic is that um, it was the, it, 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 let's say that, you know, that 85 mil sell into that curve pool, right? Into three pool um, after the liquidity got pulled, that could have just been somebody doing it by accident, right? Because maybe there was just some large whale that was also thinking the same thing that we were thinking, which is that, oh, uh, we're going to wait to see like once if liquidity starts to come down, and then we're going to take the last clip of it to exit our, our anchor position. And they just didn't know that the migration was happening. Right? Maybe communication wires got crossed. They just one day they just see, oh shit, somebody pulled up, uh, pulled out tons of uh, liquidity out of three pool. Okay, guys, it's time we got to pull out. Right? Mm-hmm. So it could have like it could have just been an accident of not knowing that the migration was happening that caused this guy to panic, which caused further guys to panic, and then the stampede happens and everybody tramples each other to death through the small door. Right? So that that would be the most ironic thing is that maybe it was just them, you know, TFL not having broadly communicated that the migration was happening or maybe it wasn't even their fault maybe they did and it was just some random guy who just had no idea and wasn't following things that closely they were not like super into luna and, and ust not following the news on that very closely they were just some casual you know whale farmer of anchor and then they just monitored the liquidity and they got scared and then and they caused the stampede so all of that is possible i i, I never want to chalk up to um you know uh, malicious intent what can be easily explained by human stupidity so um mm. and, and i think i think it's also a funny story if that was the case too so you're not of the uh, you're not of the belief that maybe citadel or i think the rumor was blackstone or black rock was behind this uh no there's just i don't think it's even possible it, it's more likely that that citadel could have than black rock i think black rock's absolutely impossible i think for yeah, citadel sure. very very unlikely i think these large tradfi institutions for them to even get a compliance approval to make some kind of weird play like this i mean it, you know it had to have been brewing for like 6 months right and even then i think compliance would say no so <clears throat> i think overall it's just not uh uh, it's just not really in the wheelhouse. I mean, what was this? I mean, this was like a 4chan post and then yeah, literally, you know, some rando makes a post on 4chan and then BlackRock and Citadel actually have to respond. I mean, what world do we live in? You know, this is kind of wild that they literally have to deny a rumor started by some rando uh, uh, on 4chan. Uh, you know, what I think is that the, the market was really just entering the phase of uh, finger pointing. Now that finally all the hope is gone and we realize that this doesn't work, well, whose fault is it, right? And, you know, TFL, very happy to say, oh, you know, probably not our fault. You know, somebody who caused this. It was the attacker. It's the shorts problem, 
problems, right? They, mm-hmm. They're the ones that cause this uh, for all of you guys. Don't, don't bring your torches and pitchforks to us. Really, you should take it to these nebulous, abstract attackers, you know, whoever they may be, you know, diffuse your anger through them. So I think that's really um, a lot of it what was going on. But, but honestly, um, a lot of it too is that uh, the mob themselves want somebody to blame right? Like nobody's going to just do the self-reflection necessary in the heat of the moment, maybe later on. And I am hopeful, but in the heat of the moment to say, oh, it was my fault, right? It was like, oh, I, I was greedy. And that's why this, this happened, right? They're going to say, oh no, it's TFL's fault. Oh no, it's like BlackRock's fault. Oh no, it's Galois' fault. It's this, this, and that. They're going to point the finger everywhere before, you know, they point it at the mirror. Um, and I think maybe after the cool down, I think maybe it's a lot more sobering. Um, and, and, you know, there can be some time for self-reflection, but I think, um, I think that's basically what was going on. And that's why you, you, you know, people come up with these wild conspiracy theories. Um, it could have just been an accident. Like nobody likes to talk about it. It could literally have just been an accident, you know? Yeah. I think over time, um, the public will put the blame on the right people. Um, and I, I think especially for, for a lot of retails out there, I feel bad for them because they're kind of promised this safe savings product. And I know I've heard a lot of anecdotes about people putting in a lot of their savings into it. Um, and they kind of trusted whatever they saw online. Um, and maybe there were endorsements from influencers as well. So over time, I, I do think there will be, you know, hopefully some some vindication and hopefully some of these people will, some of the retails, especially the smaller guys would get, um, you know, bailed out in some way. I mean, I, I, know, I know there are a few plans that are in motion right now. And I'd love to get your thoughts on some of these plans as well. So if you look back at the past few days, there have been a few proposals. The first proposal to save UST was, you know, to, to deploy capital back in the curve pool, and it did restore the pack for a little bit. And you mentioned that uh, for a brief moment, you thought, hey, maybe, maybe uh, that would fix it. But obviously, that, that didn't, you know, fix the pack. And then the second proposal that they put forth was, you know, they're just going to let Luna inflate away all the bet debt. So I'm curious, you know, what was your thought on that when you saw that they're going to just let Luna inflate like infinitely? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what my thought on that is that I, I don't have a particular problem with any of the choices that were made. I think really the issue is, is that you need to communicate this stuff properly and you need to make sure that there's no insider trading of this information, right? Mm-hmm. So like, for example, if in the war room where you have all these investors and all these like, uh, you know, high, high up people uh, in the, the terror ecosystem, if they decide, okay, now we're going to raise the limit of how much can be minted and redeemed from, you know, X amount, 250 mil per day down now to a million units of Luna per minute, right? Like you can imagine that even in the moments that that is being discussed, if there's a big enough population in that group, some people are going to start front running that news, right? Because they're going to know that Luna is going to be hyperinflating. Like I wouldn't be surprised if people in that war room and their own investors at some point with the privilege of information started shorting Luna themselves, right? And that exacerbates the problem, right? And in a way, it's kind of like double dipping. I mean, these guys already got such good deals on the seed round and huge discounts, you know, and already such huge appreciation, and now get to double dip and uh, you know dip and and dump on retail with access to privilege information. So I think that's really what the issue is. Regardless of the decisions that they made, is as long as it was not publicly broadcast and telegraphed, and you know, people, you know, there were insiders who had to come to these decisions in the first place. There was, there's always going to be leaks, and there's always going to be um, some flows in the market that are adverse to retail. So that's really what the issue is, right? Um, now, <clears throat> in terms of this idea of like defending the peg versus letting the peg break and then hyperinflating Luna, I mean, really, they should have already had a prescription and a play by play in place that they follow down to the T, right? Now, uh, there is some argument to be said that they need some flexibility, right? It's like you can't fully advertise exactly what you're going to do because then the market's going to adapt, right? But overall, to avoid these kinds of conflicts of interest problems, um, you know, which which I think are, are very huge, right? Like, why why is it like there, there, there's definitely going to be investors um, here where they should have blown up, but they didn't. And one can only wonder why, right? And how, you know, how did they make certain profits during this collapse that most other people could not have made, right? Especially on their side, right? So I think, um, you know, there needs to be something, uh, something of an investigation. We really need to clean out this kind of corruption within the space. Um, I think they need a change of leadership. Uh, just even, even symbolically, they need that, um, you know, just to placate um, all the people and all the lunatics in order for any chance of a recovery plan uh, for not being immediately dumped, right? Um, 
So, you know, those are, those are some of my thoughts. Um, you know, I think in the end, it does look like the reserves were used to defend the peg. But if people just knew when those clips were, uh, you know, pushed into the market, that's huge um, information. I mean, that's a huge information asymmetry. Uh, and that's not particularly fair to the average retail holder. Mm. Yeah, in hindsight, I guess they could have been a bit clearer and a bit uh, prompter with the communication because there was a stretch of time when they were pretty quiet. Uh, but I do think that these conflicts of interest will be very hard to avoid. Just in times of crisis like this, you could open it up for a vote for everybody, but that would probably you know, make it an even slower. So I do empathize with how difficult it is for them to kind of pull this off. But I also kind of understand yeah, the point about the, the transparency. Um, and I guess t- speaking of their responses, their latest response so far is, they announced, I think, earlier today that they have about $84, $85 million in reserves left if you don't count UST or Luna. So significantly lower than a lot of people were thinking. They, they thought maybe they have a billion dollars left. So based on just you know rough back, back of the envelope uh, math, it means that um, you know if they do bail out all of the circulating UST, that's you know 90% less value than where it is trading at right now. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm curious about if you were in their shoes, right, with this $80 million in reserves, what can they possibly do to, you know, placate as many people as possible? Uh, I think there's nothing they can do, really. I mean, like, it's just too small. 80, 84 mil against overhangs of billions of bad debt. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's not going to move the needle. Um you know, I think there have been proposals, and I think they're at least now thinking about, I think, things a little bit in the, the spirit of the right way, which is to favor the smaller wallets uh, as much as possible. Now, that being said, I think in terms of like legal uh, and fairness kind of claims on this, uh, you know, 84 mil, I think it really actually should be pro rata. Um, but the, the concept of favoring retail, I think, is good. So what my opinion is, is they just do this 84 mil pro rata on the UST, right? Um, but then in the recovery proposal, have a proposal that strongly fevers a retail for the airdrop. Because at the end of the day, they do have the right to make any fork. The IP of all this code is owned by TFL. So it's totally up to them. They can literally airdrop to whoever they want. They can airdrop everything to Doe if they want to, right? And there, there's nothing that prohibits them from assigning uh, any kind of proportion of the new Luna to any group, uh, particular group. Um, so, but as opposed to with UST in the current state, I do feel like there is already kind of a mandate that the UST holders be treated equally, right? So even though I agree with the concept of favoring retail, I think here probably best just, I mean, it's so small, the amount might as well just, um, you know, un- unless like the bigger wallets agree to forfeit their stake, which I think would be um, better, right? I think if, if, if the bigger wallets voluntarily forfeit their claim to the 84 million, well, then maybe, you know, it starts to become a little bit more material for the smaller guys. I think that's a clean solution. But, you know, in terms of the recovery plan, I think, um, there's a lot of considerations, and I think their very first proposal was a bit. Um, it was it was kind of like trying to chop Solomon's baby. You know what I mean? Like nobody, no no side is going to be happy, and I'm and I'm very sympathetic to that idea. But nevertheless, I think the numbers and the consideration should be worked out fairly carefully, and we shouldn't rush this thing. Um, there's a lot of consideration. In my opinion, here are some of the considerations. The first is that um, you definitely want to favor retail over institutions because if you do that, the bear market overall will be shorter and they will come back sooner and they are the lifeblood of crypto. Um, And then that long-term benefits the institutions anyway, at least the ones that survive, right? The ones that go belly up, well, they just want as much cash now as possible just to give back to their investors. They're closing down anyway. But for most institutions, they do benefit in the long run by having retail made as whole as possible. Um, the other consideration is that um, we should. How do you figure out um, who is most likely to dump the new chain versus uh, hold on to the new chain? Well, you can look at on-chain activity in Luna V1, and you can see well who is somebody that held Luna from before the peg broke till the very end, and are still holding it, and the the, the coins never move from that address, right? Um, so for folks like that, uh, maybe they deserve a greater multiplier on their share of the new Luna tokens, right? Not from an an element of fairness, but from an element of making it work and maximizing the value for everybody uh, that has this new token, right? And you can look at, for example, the same thing for UST. You can look at even the B Luna itself, right? You could categorize it as people who uh, held their Luna bonded, never unbonded, 
I never even initiated unbonding throughout this entire thing. Uh, and then people who initiated unbonding, but obviously didn't bond, and, you know, it takes like 24 days to unbond, so they never got their Luna, right? Maybe they're kind of kind of in the class of, you know, the Luna holders that never moved, or maybe they're in a slightly worse class than Luna holders that didn't move, but at least they're, they're pretty equivalent. But the bonded Luna guys who never uh, even tried to unbond, I would put them as senior to uh, the Luna holders that never move their Luna, right? At least you can intuit at least an, an ordinal ranking to these different groups as to who is most likely uh, to hold the token, uh, the new token and not dump it, right? And then there's also questions about what happened to all the people who bought this stuff in the later stages uh, when it was hyperinflating. Well, one argument is that, oh, these are all speculators. By the time it hits sub sub penny, you know, these people are just looking for like quick pumps. They're just playing the market. They want a lotto ticket, this, this, and that. They're not like true believers and they're going to dump, you know, once they get their lotto ticket and it pays out, uh, which I think is somewhat true. Um, but on the other hand, um, you also want to uh, incentivize and reward people who are willing to buy something that is hyperinflating, right? Like at the end of the day, the last line of defense against all of the UST uh, unwinding was people willing to buy under hyperinflationary uh, periods, right? So like the service that they provided, should that go unrewarded, right? And what kind of you know percentage cut should they get, right? So I think all of these um, need to be thought through. What happens to all the Luna uh, and the airdrop to the people on the exchanges? Well, you know, I figure that, um, you know, uh, maybe one way you can do it is you could just let the exchanges assign it, right? You say, here's the lump sum, and you figure out who, how you want to assign it to all these retail. But maybe, maybe the exchanges don't want to do that because then, you know, maybe gives them uh, legal culpability, right? And they don't want to have any of that to even decide. So if they if they got it, they just do a pro rata to everybody, right? So there's a lot of these kinds of considerations, right? Um, on what to do. I mean, should the uh, should the exchanges get more or should they get less? Um, what about the size of the addresses, right? What if like, you know, for these addresses, if they're really huge and it's clearly a whale, maybe there's like a slightly negative multiplier. Maybe we have some kind of log function or some kind of square root or, you know, some kind of like raised to the, you know, two thirds power or one third power, um, you know, kind of um, scaling function. Um, so you don't, you know, you, you don't want to penalize them too hard, you know, just to be fair. But at the same time, maybe you want to, uh, you know, favor the smaller wallets a little bit uh, more. So these are, these are all some of these considerations on this reconstruction plan. And I actually offered uh, to help them and, uh, you know, I said, you know, I'm happy to talk to Doe. I went through multiple avenues. Uh, I, you know, I don't want to name names, but I went through multiple avenues to try and reach the guy. Uh, again, ignored me. You know, <laughs> I, I reached out to him once in like January, ignored me. Uh, and now I reached out to him again, ignored me. Uh, I asked for an invite to the war room. They don't want to have me. I mean, I understand. I'm very disliked. I'm very hated in that group, <laughs> right? I understand. But at this point, like how, how, how is peace made? Peace happens when we are finally able to make peace with our enemies, right? That, that, that's how we can move on from this whole episode. So even though we're on the different sides of the battlefield, like, can we try and move on from this? I think our incentives at this point are fairly aligned. I even agreed to close down all of my uh, Luna and UST positions uh, and help facilitate this recovery. Um, and I, I, you know, in the beginning, I asked them, well, you know, because I wanted, so I don't want to do work for free. I think I have some good ideas. I understand the mechanism super well. So I was joking around saying, oh, we should get like 0.25% uh, of the new tokens on the new Luna chain. But, you know, honestly, uh, we're also willing to accept zero. Like uh, the way that I think it should happen is that basically um, afterwards out of the community pool, however much goes there, they can just do a vote and we'll, I don't really even lower the price. We'll say like 10 basis points, right? We'll take 0.1% uh, of the new network for our help in the recovery process and let the community vote. You know, if the community says uh, we don't deserve it or they're just particularly vindictive because of what had happened, well, let that be an outlet for their rage. That's healthier for everybody. They can screw us over, not pay us anything. That's fine. I'll accept zero, right? Uh, but I think if they want to reward um, help and they want to reward good behavior and having uh, you know people volunteer to contribute their thoughts that I think would be valuable, then if they want to give us, you know, uh, 10 basis points of the new circulating supply, um, then, you know, we happily accept. But I think, you know, to, to just have no communication whatsoever, um, you know, I think is, 
is pretty tough. You know, they, they sent the community manager to come talk to us. I don't want to talk to the community manager because the community manager is there to placate people, right? Uh, and to basically say and 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 you know, uh, you know, do psyops and do shit like that. I want to talk to people who are in charge of designing this new mechanism, right? And the and the, and the financial team and the leadership team about how to actually do the splits on, on you know these kinds of things, right? So I, I'm not just trying to get you know appeased to say, oh, we heard you out, right? Like, don't, don't send me the community manager. Like, can I talk to the man himself? You know, like, I think at this point, my incentives with him are much more aligned than with his investors, because I, my proposal is to protect retail here and give them the bulk of it, right? The institutions, his investors might be mad, but it is in Do Kwan's interest to favor retail, right? Because, because at this point, like, you know, the investors, you know, whether you piss them off a little bit more or not, it doesn't really matter, but he doesn't want the angry mob coming after him, Right. Um, so like me and him were pretty aligned and that's why I wanted to talk to the man himself. Uh, but once again, uh, was not, was not able to, um, and maybe one last thing uh, I want to say, which is that even from a symbolic, uh, point, you know, I think that, you know, at least I think TFL is very necessary. Like if you have multiple, multiple forks, right. And not, but basically none of them are going to accrue value. It's better just to have one shot at something. It may still dump, but we want to minimize the chance of that new coin dumping. <laughs> So I think TFL is necessary. They have all the devs um, that are most familiar with the code. So I think they're necessary. We got to keep that going. But there needs to be a leadership change, even if very just symbolically, right, because of Do Kwan's personality and that kind of stuff. And I think he might even be happy to step down and have the heat taken off of him. And I think we should just put Nick Plotius in place because Nick, uh, even though he's a little bit of a grifter, Nick is a pussy and he's not going to do some crazy shit. Right, he's not going to do some wild and crazy shit because he's not as brave as Doe, and that's the kind of person that we need in charge of this recovery plan and to be the head of the organization, right? Because he he's too scared of what might happen if he does something bad. So that's actually a great incentive for the not to not to have anything bad happen. So I think the perfect uh, uh, figurehead or person to put in place would be <laughs> Nick Plotius. Uh, yeah. you know, I, I don't mean to directly cast so many aspersions against Nick, but I think, you know, strategically, this does make sense. He is one of the least likely to have any kind of weird malfeasance or anything like that, especially with all the public's eyes on him. Um, you know, he's, he's the least bold, you know, out of, out of a lot of those guys. So I think the perfect uh, person to put in charge there. Yeah. Um, so those are just sort of my thoughts there. You know? Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I don't think I will endorse that <laughs> characterization of Nick, um, but I, I do agree that there needs to be a leadership change. And Nick actually came on the show very, very early on in the Terra Luna project to describe kind of the mechanism. So we, we've gone full circle there, but it, it sounds like the, um, the kind of the synthesis of that is with whatever assets they have left, the 80 or so million dollars, they should just reimburse that. And then when it comes to launching Luna as a new chain, they should really take the time to consider how to structure the mechanism and the distribution of that. Um, and I think that's something that we can definitely agree with. Um, and I, I know we're running out of time here, but one of the community members really does want to know, are there any other projects um, in crypto right now that kind of reminds you of Luna that gives you, say, a higher than 20% chance that something similar could happen to them? Um, yeah. Uh, and what I would say is that there's tons of garbage projects, I think, in crypto. I mean, uh, you know, with every cycle, at least like 95% of projects are garbage, right? Uh, but it's just not the revelation of that just doesn't happen until much later. Um, and there's also uh, very strict narratives to not say that, uh, because, you know, nobody wants to just slam their own portfolio companies and say, well, 95% of you are going to die and, and be garbage, right? <laughs> so it's just, it's not, not good for business. I mean, I can say that because we don't have uh, any portfolio companies. Um, so so I think there's, there's a lot of projects like that. But the thing is that I'm not that keen on expressing my views on that because, you know, for the most part, if you look at um, the history of our firm, we've been actually very, very quiet. You know, we, we, we haven't really been that outspoken about anything. And then the times that we... Um, said some things. It was mostly on long plays, right? We talked about Wi-Fi. We talked about FTT. You know, this is the only time where we've been very vocal about a short, and we have shorted before. But we, you know, this is the only time we've been very vocal. And the whole reason is because this thing had gotten to such a big um, level that it really affected the entire crypto space. So generally, for things that I don't think affects the rest of the community, I'm just going to you know play my own longs, play my own shorts, uh, really keep it close to the chest. I mean, I'm not 
um, that interest in, in, in sharing, uh, you know, too many of my thoughts there. And I think also for diplomatic reasons, right? Like at the end of the day, you know, you see the same people in crypto. Um, you know, I've been here a while, but you see a lot of the same faces. So I don't really want to, you know, ruin relations with people. I just thought that this one in particular, unfortunately, I did have to burn some bridges because unfortunately, you know, this has just gotten too big and it really affected all of our livelihoods. I mean, it's affecting my bottom line. It's affecting your bottom line. It's affecting everybody's. It's even affecting their bottom line. They just don't, didn't even realize it, right? It's affecting everybody's bottom line. So um, I thought that was worthwhile uh, to just sound the alarm and let people know. But for everything else, I think it, it's all relatively safe. Like even as they fail, it, they won't really contagion into the rest of the space. It'll just implode. Uh, holders will lose money, but not much beyond that, right? Um, so there's not much systemic risk. And I think those experiments are good. Like at the end of the day, if people desire to play money games, then that should kind of exist. No matter how stupid it is, no matter how it always ends up, um, if there must be an outlet for the demands of the people, and if people really like to gamble and really like to play money games, then they should be allowed to do so. And I think we shouldn't try and constrict that. We should, but we should just make sure that it doesn't get big enough to a point where it really causes systemic damage and contagion um, across the rest of the space. Um, and even if it got to that point, it's not that we should centrally control and shut it down, but we should be vocal about it. In a decentralized way, people should stand up and say, hey, you know, I know this is an unpopular idea. I know I'm going to take a lot of flack for this from everybody, including a lot of my own friends who are these investors, right? But, you know, this needs to be said, and you guys are on the wrong side of it here, and we need to unwind this thing as, as soon as possible before it causes even more damage, you know? And I think... Um, you know, if, I think if everybody can do that, if everybody can just do a little bit of public service, you know, for, for, for most of it, you know, for most of our, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, existence as Galwa Capital, we really never did much public service, right? Like our business is, we're just here to turn money into more money, right? But like, that's our business, right? Um, and I don't feel bad about that. But every, I think for everybody to just do one thing, this is my one public service. I don't want to do the next crusade. I don't want to take down the next coin. I don't want to, you know, <laughs> mob is angry. They already got, they're already out of bed with their torch, uh, pitchforks and torches, right? They're like, oh, let's go fucking burn down something else now. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like that, that was, that was the big one that we need to get rid of. Like, let's not, why did, why did people start shorting tether? I don't understand. You know, now everybody's trying to short everything, you know, it's like, no, 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 no. Like that, that was, that was the one, that was the one big thing. And then like, let's all just calm down now. Now, you know, that's not nothing else is quite as uniquely dangerous as that. Um, but if there is ever another case like that, I really hope someone else will lead the charge and I don't have to go stick my neck out there again, uh, because there are very serious personal costs to that. Um, and there are very serious um, costs to, um, you know, the firm itself. You know, we, we, we um, you know, we definitely pay some costs as Galois Capital uh, to be on that side. So, you know, I think about it as public service, but if we all do a little bit, I'm not asking every firm to just altruistically not run a business and only do things for the space. I'm saying do what makes sense for your bottom line, but just once, just one time, if everybody just does it once, then I think we can survive very well as an industry. Um, just stick your neck out once. And if everybody did that, we're good, basically. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. <laughs> and I think we're going to look back and you're kind of the Michael Burry uh, of the crypto version of the big short here, uh, kind of revealing some of the things that, you know, no one was paying attention to, or at least no one wanted to talk about. And, you know, it's not always easy, but I, I think in the end, I think you did do the right thing in warning the space. It's really unfortunate that it had to play out this way. And I think it does set the industry back maybe a few years just because of how many people have been hurt by this. So hopefully we'll be able to, you know, stick our necks out there and prevent the next thing from happening. But uh, Kevin, really, really appreciate you coming on and sharing with us all your process. I know it's been a really busy few days and you must be super tired, um, but I'm really excited to share this with the community, man. Um, yeah, man, really appreciate you having me on. And uh, yeah, you know, um, wishing the best for the space as we, you know, pull the pieces back together and move forward. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a bit optimistic. You know, I think overall, at least, um, you know, it happened now rather than later because it would have been a lot more devastating. So I'm actually somewhat optimistic that we can come out of this bear cycle a bit quicker than last time. Um, so, you know, here's to hoping for that. Yeah, definitely. That's a great note to end this on.